So this the, the topic is medicine beyond books and protocols. But if you're thinking that I'm going to give sort of highly advanced stuff, you are wrong. You can leave the hall right now itself. Uh, but, uh, uh, but but what I'm going to tell you now might be useful for life. Right now, just as you were entering, or you just entered, um, you would have uh, seen there was a video presentation of a chalk and board presentation on TikTok. It was about public enemy number one. Now, in that, what she was describing is the sort of misconceptions that we that have entered into our brain roughly about 30, 40 years ago, when we thought that cholesterol was public enemy number one, and that was the cause of heart attacks. And in that lecture, even if you didn't get in what, what was said, is okay, um, what she was trying to say is how bad the knowledge of lipids in connection with strokes and heart disease was, right? A total, whole lot of his conceptions, which was, she was trying to explain. Now, supposing this lady was born 50 years behind, she also would have had the same misconceptions. And if she is going to be born another 30 or 40 years in front, right, in uh, 2050 or so, she will be singing another song as well. Why? Because the, the, the stuff that we learn becomes very easily out of date. Uh, so that is why we have to keep changing, we have to keep changing uh, Okay, so I have to be thank you. So now, what essentially she was talking about was that people observed certain things. People observed a two. People observed another two, put both together, and made six. That's what we are usually make, doing most of the time. That's why we are making mistakes. It's not going down. Ah, slide. Right. OK. It's OK. It's OK. It's OK. Right. All right. It's OK. Now, this uh, saying from Albert Einstein, he says, the development of science seeks in the main to satisfy the longing for pure knowledge and wisdom. Now, I circle pure because then Einstein would have recognized that there's impure knowledge as well. Right? Okay. Further, quotes from uh, uh, on knowledge and wisdom. Socrates said, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing or very little. But unfortunately, scientists, practitioners, all these people think they know everything, including students. Uh, I also did so when I was a student in the second day BBS. Right? Uh, but actually, in fact, we know nothing or very little. And this also prompted Gloria Steinem to say, the first problem for all of us is not to learn, but to unlearn or de-learn. Simplifying, we think we know everything when we know nothing or very little. Of the little we know, a large part is unreliable, needing unlearning or de-learning. That is why editions have to change, protocols have to change, practices have to change, right? And, you, and what you saw in the video, uh, people have to de uh, make people de-learn and relearn uh, things because what we are finding as knowledge uh, is so unreliable. Why is it that we are having unreliable matter for learning? The problem may be in the resources or the problem may be in the learner or both 
or maybe even something else. But we'll delve into that. The problem of scientific knowledge may be in the process or evolution of scientific knowledge, the way it has evolved. In the evolution of scientific knowledge, you will see that we have a bubble of knowledge. There is a confined bubble of knowledge, a small bubble in a vast ocean of ignorance. And there are particles of knowledge, K1, K2, K3, K4, etc., where people, scientists, say they, they look into this bubble of knowledge and see whether there are things which are controversial or whether there are insufficiencies, right? Uh, or wrong things mentioned and uh, if they find something like that they make that observation that there is something different and then they have a hypothesis and they test the null hypothesis against the alternative hypothesis so we call this the O1 and we will call this H1 and they do the test test T1 and they make a new observation O2 which becomes a part of knowledge K2 right so that is how that is how scientific knowledge is built up and then another person might take this k and then do the same process again and then another one like that so by and by this knowledge bubble gets filled with various material um, uh, 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 for, 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 for the benefit of people at least, at least that is what we think now you would think that scientific information is very reliable is it really because most of the most of the, uh, the the research that fill up this knowledge bubble is done by in the universities and as you know in the universities you need points to get promotion so that you they are they they they, they usually resort to things called sliced salami research which is you take the same salami and slice it and slice it and slice it once upon a time long time ago when um, aids came into uh, the scene there were so many researchers, attitudes, knowledge, attitudes and practices of nurses towards AIDS. Then somebody else would say of the same thing, knowledge, attitude and practices uh, on AIDS uh, um, in uh, garment workers or security people, police people, right? So that is what you call salami research. There is a repetition of whole lot of things. Although there is a lot of knowledge, there is very little knowledge that can be taken as useful. Then also there's for social and political things, political, economic things, right? For reasons, uh, recently we had uh, a, a doctor who, had, who, who, who paid a huge price by saying that there was uh, malnutrition in this country which is increasing after the, 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 uh, the, the economic problems. Then there were other people who said otherwise from the opposite side. So I mean, when people do research with political agendas in their mind, then they produce research that supports them. If it doesn't support them, they throw it. Right? So therefore, there's a lot of bias. And there's dogmatism, even in religion. Uh, once upon a time, they said, breastfeeding, how long? Breastfeed as long as possible. So they breastfed for one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, school years, right? And even when they fell in love, they started breast breastfeeding uh, with their with their, uh, with their with their with their lovers and and then wives and uh, so many others, right? So then then the WHO found okay, but this, there's some, something really wrong with this. So they said, right, breastfeed for up to two years. Now I asked them why why two years. Why not one and a half years? Why not one year? Why not, why not nine months? Right? So they said, no, this is, uh, we, are, we are sensitive to uh, religious thinking. And apparently there is a religion which says uh, uh, you need to breastfeed until two years. I'll come back to this one. Uh, but uh, my registrar was from that religious sect and I asked him, is this true? And he went and uh, inquired from so many so many uh, religious teachers and he came and told me no there's no truth in it right that is just hand put stuff you know into religion <laughs> people just say something and then it gets drag dragged out right then also publishers you find publishers cheap publishers who will publish anything so it doesn't need to be very scientific or, or need to be plausible they'll publish anything 
but very, very few researches are being done for true knowledge. So this bubble of knowledge is, this bubble of knowledge is not clear blue as it is shown here. It is polluted. And therefore, this knowledge gets into books, protocols, lectures, health magazines, and web-based information, right? And into your practice. And that is the, the, the danger of having unreliable uh, knowledge material in the, in the world. So, again, we go, go back to this, this Einstein's thing. The development of science seeks in the main to satisfy the longing for pure knowledge. Now, what we find is that most of the knowledge is impure, polluted, right? It's like this. It should be like this. Clear blue mass of knowledge, but actually it's a very murky, muddy sort of thing that you have, even in scientific research. Another problem, that was a problem of qualitative problem. There is another problem in quantitative terms. The quantitative problem is this bubble that we have of knowledge is so small and when you put it against ignorance, it, the ignorance is so wide and so profuse that this bubble is maybe, uh, maybe uh, compared to a small bubble in the ocean of knowledge. Now, this, this is not bubble of knowledge but the, the, the rest of it is all ignorance, right? So that's, that's so much. I mean, so there is a virgin field out there for people who do very good research, right? Who do true research. So scientific knowledge is afflicted by two problems. One is insufficiency. We know so little. The other one is inaccuracy. Little we know is also not pure. Reiterating, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing and add to that, the little you know is much polluted, dirty and unreliable. So this reminds me of uh, our own times when, when computers came into being here. Um, uh, we, were, we were practicing people uh, and uh, then they used to advertise uh, monitors and printers as WISWIG. What you see is what you get. because. Most of the computers and the monitors, they were not at tandem. And if you, if you, uh, sorry, if you, if you get a picture like this, sometimes when you get a printout, this blue sky might appear as yellow or green. There was a mismatch. So they say, with not wig, which means what you see is not what you get. That is what the, the status of computers and the printers that we had during that time. But as we progressed, they became with big things. And now, of course, mo most of the time, you will see that the colors are the same. But if you are a really good artist, you will see small, discernible uh, changes in the colors and, and tones, etc. Same thing with knowledge. Wick wit is what you know is what is true. But that is not true. What you know is not what is true. That is why that lady who was there was d doing a lecture on debunking the, the theory of cholesterol in the genesis of heart, heart disease, right? So what you know is not what is true. Non-recognition of these limitations can lead to harmful or fatal situations or make a fool of yourself in retrospect. And I'm going to quote you some examples of this phenomenon. These examples I take from 50 years ago. Now you might ask me, ask me why, why I'm taking 50 years ago? Because to the foolish mind, to the limited IQs that we have as human beings, all the homo sapiens, you call them homo sapiens, homo sapiens means the wise one, the wise, they are not wise at all, right? Uh, so it takes about, for the penny to drop, it takes about 10 to uh, sorry, about uh, three to four decades, right? And it is only in respect that you discover your stupidity and the fact that the, that, that the knowledge that you had was actually uh, bunkum. So this, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you about wit not wit, which is what you know is not what is true. Two stories from the 1960s 
uh, when we were school children, there was an agriculture graduate who was living in our place, and she was an absolute pain in the neck. Because she used to always say, if there are carrots, like, kanna, kanna, carrot in tea and ah, kanna, kanna, vitamin C tea and all like that, right? But now we know. We eat carrots, not for the vitamin A, but for a whole lot of other nutrients, as well as non-nutrients, more than that, non-nutrients, uh, plus so many yet to know reasons. And the, the plain and simple reason why we are eating uh, carrot is because our ancestors used to eat that without any problem, right? So, but you take the new ones, new foods, you eat them after a few times, you know that there are, there are problems emanating, right? Another example. This was in 1960s, long, long time ago, before your grandfathers were born. Uh, that was when, when I was learning uh, uh, chemistry for my ALO. Yuri Gagarin has just uh, finished going round space and he has come back. And uh, uh, he was encased in a small capsule. And uh, one, one of the reasons why he couldn't stay long in space was because if he was going to stay long, he had to carry more food. And he couldn't carry more food because there was a weight limitation. But my chemistry teacher was optimistic. He said, the amount of nutrients you need is in milligrams. Man has synthesized all that. You can put into a capsule all what your, your nutrients that are needed for a day. And so if you have 1,000 capsules with you, you can revolve around the revolve around space for more than three years. So he used to say, science is so advanced now. <laughs> but, but now, and I used to say, oh my God, oh, what a, what a brilliant teacher. But uh, now, looking back 50 years ago, right, we see that uh, if, if they went out with those, those, those capsules, there wouldn't have been a human being who would come back to Earth again. In the 1970s, and now we were doing biochemistry and we were medical students, we, then we did biochemistry. And in biochemistry, we learned that this, this, there were two vegetables that were looked down upon. That is, patola and puhul. So this puhul patola story was, I don't know whether it was, uh, <laughs> whether it was prevailing uh, during your times, but during our time, puhul and patola was a big joke, right? The reason being that we learned what we, we, we learned as good food were good foods high in protein, calories, vitamins, and minerals. So, pool and patola was useless because more than 95% was water. So, and that time we said there, there was a lot of uh, protein calorie malnutrition, and we used to write on the BHDs uh, HPD or high protein diet, and they used to get fish butter, oil, and dal with very little vegetable or greens or yellows or browns. And so, but, but the, the paradox is that most of these people who had protein, calorie, malnutrition, they didn't die of nutrition problem, but they died of infection. So if they had been given puhul and, uh, 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 puhul and uh, the other one, right, uh, patola, Maybe the immune modulatory factors in them might have saved them from death. So you see again uh, the, the, the short-lived value of uh, knowledge. I used to take this to the dine, dining hall as well. I was coming from home and I took this uh, newly discovered knowledge which I got from the uh, faculty uh, to the dining table at home and vehemently refused to eat puhul and patola. Now my grandfather was there one day and he said, do you know all what your body needs? So say, yes, Satta. Now, we are, because we are taught all these things, we know calories, we know proteins, we know lipids, and we know minerals, there are vitamins, right? And uh, those are the things that are needed for, uh, for you to survive. And uh, so therefore, there is, Puhul is useless, uh, Patol is useless. So then he said, right, maybe someday in the future, a person might discover the merit of eating puhul and patola. This statement went over my low IQ head and made a fool of myself in later life. 
and I also lost the benefits of the immune modulatory action of Puhul and Patola during that long period of about 10 to 20 years, uh, during which time I had this misconception about uh, the value of food. Next example from the 1970s when we were doing in an introductory appointment in surgery. Now this very <laughs> This is a very interesting thing because we, we uh, the introductory sur surgery was done in the professorial unit and we had a very interesting professor of surgery. He was an excellent teacher, absolutely excellent teacher. He had a single name but changed to something sounding more Indian. Uh, he had his name was H. S. Kirti Singha but then he took that K off and said H. S. K. Singha, right? And and he, he got educated in England, so, uh, so obviously they didn't want long names. And um, uh, uh, so he, 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 may, he changed his name. He had a well chiseled body. He had well chiseled body, wore a bow tie, talked, walked, and ate like an Englishman. But at lunch, he ate two quadrilles and one cup of tea, right? And he ate that in the student's canteen. A vade would cost five cents those days, two vades, ten cents. One cup of uh, milk tea was, uh, that is, kirite was 10 cents. So his total cost for lunch is 10 cents. Now he would look at our, our lunches. And we had these mounds of rice. Uh, and that cost, uh, that cost uh, uh, a rupee, which was five times the cost of his lunch. And uh, he would finish his lunch and then pull the bow tie, walk past us and say, the price you pay for useless roughage. Right. He was also uh, a, a real taskmaster and he said common things first. And uh, suddenly we are, think, we are thinking of something or he's talking to us about something else and then had, suddenly he'll say, what is the bird that you just heard? If uh, your professor asks, what is the bird that you just heard, what would you say? Can you give a shout? <laughs> so, so people will say sparrows and various not kingfishers and all, all that sort of thing. <laughs> no. If you ask that question, you have to say crow because most of the birds that are around the hospital are crows. Right? So therefore, if you say there's a peacock or uh, uh, some other one, you're not going to get right. So think of the common things first. That is because he wanted us to think of the common medical problems as well first before we thinking of, of uh, esoteric things. So, in the same way, he is asked, what is the commonest health problem that you see in this ward, which was the professorial ward? So now, we had many offers as students. Uh, head injury, it was common. Head injury was not due to vehicular accidents like now, because Vehicular accident, there were no vehicles those days. If, even if you go to Perdane Road, you will, uh, after about 20 minutes only, you will hear a vehicle, right? So, but how did they get head injury? Coconut falling on their head or jackfruit falling on their head, right? That is the type of head injury that most people had. So, we remember that. Ah, yeah, that is the type of head. So, yeah. And then we had to think of Burgess disease. Do you have, still have it? Do you have Burgess disease? Do you have? Thromboangiitis obliterans. Do you have it? I don't know. We used to have one a penny those days. People, people who were on the floor, lined up on the, the corridors uh, with no fingers, no toes, right? Some fingers missing, some, some toes missing, uh, some part of the lower limb missing, upper limb missing, right? Because they, they have this, they had the ischemic pain and, and they used to cut off, they, they had so, so great pain. But nowadays you don't see because those days it was linked with BD. You know, BD is smoking BD. You know whether it's true or not, right? Then, of course, we were impressed by the prostate enlargement because uh, you, we could always see that with, with a urinary catheter and tied up onto a bottle. No urine bags those days and not even plastic, plastic bottles. They were real good glass bottles. So, why do we remember this very well? Because uh, off and on, they would uh, hold this bottle and go and suddenly drop the bottle and it will go into small sprinters and uh, the, the urine will spread and the smell would come out. So we, so those are the things which impressed us and uh, so in a prostate enlargement and chronic ulcers. So he said, no, 
not head injury, not Burgess disease, not prostate disease, not, not chronic ulcers, none of the above. And he asked us to check the hemoglobin of all the patients. So we did so. And lo and behold, anemia was the commonest medical, commonest health problem in the, in the surgical ward. Now, is it, why is it so common in Sri Lanka? So in, uh, the students responded in addition to iron intake, etc., etc. One person said worms. Ah, so his eyes lit up. How do you get worms? He asked. He asked the brightest girl. And so she says, flies. The word flies out of her ter terrified girl. After asking the connection between flies, feces, worms, and anemia, he would say, Ah, Mr. Fly. Oh, oh so, so, Mr. so Mr. Fly would come with a lump of shit. Please open your mouth, Miss W. Can I can I deposit? So so he he used to, he used to play fun out of the 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 standard theories that we had. So he said, no, that is not the correct explanation. Silanese people finger wash their brown backsides, smeared with fresh hot shit. Yes, yes. Worm makes get trapped under the nails. Yes, yes. Does the Kusyama do the same? Yes. Yes. Then she makes good old pole sambal. Yes. She makes good old kiri hodda, squeezing out the last drop of milk from the residue. Yes. And transfers the helmin text into your food. Yes. Yes. So we have to say yes. So we thought, oh, so clever professor. We have finished the second MB, but we have never learned things like this. Right? So, uh, we, 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 we thought, oh, he's a real a clever professor. He was a clever professor. Indeed, he was. So, what's the intervention he asked? So, a student says, sir, toilet paper. There were no bidet showers those days. So, he says, oh, toilet paper is okay as a solution for a westerner. Because he defecates only a few teaspoons of feces. But over here, you defecate the potty full and you will need rolls and rolls of toilet paper and that <coughs> will block the hospital sewers. <coughs> so, the answer he wanted was eat less roughage. So, to concentrate this, he asked, there was a war which China won over India. So, he, he asked, now there were no drones and stuff like those days. You had to go with a gun and fight. So, he asked, how did China win the war against India? So after a whole lot of things, their ammunition was better, this one not doing, they are strong, and all these sorts of things, they said, no. Uh, the, the, the reason is, the Indians ate mountains and mountains of grain. So half the time, they were eating. And the rest of the, rest of the day, they were shitting because they had to shit a lot. <laughs> so the Indians were eating and shitting while the by the Chinese who were uh, who took very highly nutritious uh, food from a small cup, they ate little and they shat little and they were shooting all the Indians who were eating and shitting. So that, that was the that was the, the explanation that he, he used to give. So the, the main thing why he wanted to drive was eating roughage is an uncivilized act. So in retrospect, a great lovable teacher fell into the trap of ignoring what I know is not what is true. We are, it is now only we understand uh, the, the, the folly of this, folly of his argument. So he could be excused because the role of roughage in health was not established at that time. But as fate, fate decreed, he went, he went to another country and he must have completed, it, uh, he must have continued a similar diet and uh, unfortunately he, he died of inflammatory bowel disease. So this is the, 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 the ultimate you know, the fate that, the, that fell upon him. Still, our love and appreciation for him is as strong as before. And if you want to, if you want to uh, learn a little bit more of this interesting professor, this is the, the reference, Sunday Times, and then, then all, that, all, that, all that, you can read it. It's very interesting reading, right? So it is a long after that time, after several decades, that we learnt that food was not only for nutrients but also for health. 
we only then learned about micro, micro, microbiome host interactions, quality of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, phytochemicals and flavonoids in, and firm, uh, in food, uh, fermented foods and their antioxidant, antimicrobial, antifungal, anti-inflammatory, anti-diabetic, and anti-atherosclerotic activity. Uh, personalized nutrition, what, what is one man's food, is the other man's poison. Uh, we uh, learnt about, uh, later on, we learnt about food and blood pressure, glycemic control, oxidative stress, uh, adipocyte metabolism, muscle health, cardiac function and metabolic expenditure, and not the last but the least about the importance of roughage, right? So by which time he was dead and gone. So the common denominator with my agriculture friend, the chemistry teacher, the surgery professor was that they ignored the advice given by Socrates that the only true wisdom is in knowing is in knowing that you know nothing or very little. And also the fact that they ignored the wisdom accrued through a million years of evolution. What all animals know, you have to eat what your ancestors ate. Otherwise you fall into trouble. Not for the white veins, not for the minerals, but uh, because your ancestors ate them. So this pitfall is not confined to individuals. WHO is, a, is another culprit. They said breastfeeding, best, best breastfeed as long as possible. Uh, their, their cardinal study for that was the Bedouin Arab study, uh, where they found that uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, that uh, children who were prolonged breastfed survived a long time. Whereas children who were, who were cut short of uh, uh, breastfeeding uh, died early. I mean, it has to be because they defecate into the oasis and they drink from the oasis. So if uh, if they were drinking, uh, they were taking breast milk, they'll be saved. So, but if they were weaned, they had to drink that, uh, the, the the rotten water. So and so so therefore, it is not surprising that uh, they survive. So now WHO put two and two together and made six and extrapolated this advice to all other countries, including ours. And we thought there was something wrong with this. Similarly, when they started weaning, first they said four months. Wean at four months. After a couple of years, they said six months. Then after another couple of years, uh, so they said four months, they became obese. Six months, then they, they, uh, they, they were poor eaters. So then they put it to five months, right? And then, then they, they, they kept changing the time. Why? Because they made wrong observations and wrong conclusions. So, they are also guilty of ignoring the advice given by Socrates that the only true wisdom is in knowing that you know nothing or little. And ignoring the wisdom accrued through a million years of evolution is not wisdom, right? So now I have given examples from peeds, uh, not from any other discipline. Are there any people from medicine? Are there any people from medicine? No. Thank God for that. Because the, the medical people are worse than us. <laughs> see? Uh, if, if, you want to, if you want to see their problems, you read this thing called potential considerations in prioritizing the test of, uh, testing of unproven medical practices. And it says, from evidence-based de-implementation for contradicted, unproven, and aspiring healthcare practices, which means all bunkum type of practice. I see a... I see a physician somewhere. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> if you, if I, if I saw you before, I wouldn't have told this. <laughs> so, and uh, so they discontinued so many things for because of unsound, useless, harmful uh, practices and lack of financial sense. I mean, leave alone all this. You can read that. You, you can leave alone all that. You ask ten physicians what is the ideal blood pressure for a 70-year-old. They'll give ten different answers. And if you are the same person in another year, he'll give he'll give another uh, he'll give a different answer from the answer that he gave one year ago, right? So physicians are not something like blood pressure. You know, if you how many blood pressures have been measured every day by doctors, and if you put the blood pressure one against the other like like that, and then you um, of of all the blood pressures measured measured in one day right around the world that thing will go right around the world 20 or 30 times, right? So just imagine, with all those measurements, still they are uncertain what the normal blood pressure is, right? Each time I go to a doctor and to so doctor and ask, uh, he'll give a different answer. 
Okay. Right? So, uh, so we are not alone as pediatricians. Uh, this happens in any discipline. It's not to be little anybody, but to but to just fill up the thing that this is not only pediatrics, right? So in medicine, there are numerous pearls of wisdom that have been passed down through generations, but few has stood the test of time because they did not consider the inaccuracy or the insufficiency of the information that they were basing their observations on. Always remember what you know is what is not true or what you know is not what is true because what the amount of knowledge that you're having today there may be a lot of problems right so don't act as if you know everything and then uh, you say oh we in, in in oxford we do this in in candy hospital we do this in peradeniya hospital we do this no whatever they do is is not not necessarily right most of the practices are not right right so remember that so i hope that with hindsight your observations practice and teaching will not have a similar fate to those uh, as to those who who my given in my examples right and if you take the practitioners um, you in relation to the knowledge you will have different different categories one is the gullibles who believe in whatever that is found in books i think most of us are in this category then there are the doubt in thomases who doubt everything that is in the book uh, all the uh, uh, the protocols and uh, right um so it's very difficult to work with them then there are the smarts or the smarters who practice with reason and caution using whatever is in the bubble but with caution and reason and then there are the brilliance who very easily detect inaccuracies and insufficiencies in the knowledge bubble but they don't stop at that they also propose alternatives to what the the wrong knowledge is so they are the so the uh, this these people are in the, in the sort of normal as uh, average category of iq these people are slightly higher but these are the people who are uh, having the highest iq so this prompts me to uh, uh, bring this cartoon in uh, that's that was drawn by my students and that man who is having a beard is supposed to be me and what is he saying if you ever run out of petrol in your vehicle this is what you do right is there anybody in that batch oh, i don't think so right this prompts me to my last uh, story which is uh, which i uh, borrow from the 1960s we were in grade 5 in school our school is in udwattakale our playground sign askiriya and we had a teacher from uk who was our under 12 cricket coach he had a two door harley davidson car it had a centrally placed battery and a centrally placed steering wheel well, like this see you see the driver here he is in the center and he is virtually sitting on the battery the battery is not in the not under the bonnet like usual cars it is under his seat and uh, please also note that there is a there is a spare wheel which is uh, tucked on to the uh, the side of the car and also there is a, an opening over here uh, which is fairly prominent now we love this car there were four of us who would wait for 30 minutes or more after school to hitch a ride to go to askiri which was about 1 km away there was a routine uniform routine in this one the school closes at 2:30 the teacher arrives at 3 between 3 and 3:15 he will look down on us and then say askiri questioning going to askiri so is there we all climb yes sir and we climb on to the the car and uh, then he starts the vehicle so we go down the hill from udwattakale past the municipal council straight through it was not one way traffic those days it was you, you could go straight through to mirakampalya and from mirakampalya you had the the the, um, the the climb up and ending up in uh, askiriya so he would put the brakes and he would 
pull the handbrake, which was in the center as well, right? He would pull the handbrake and uh, put the car, pull the car to a halt. And uh, so he said, okay, boys, ask it here. And we would disappear into the grounds. So these are routine every day. Uh, we wait, he comes, he takes, comes down, goes up, and then we disappear into Askiri. So now, this was until one fine day, one fellow managed to open this one, this lid. He just turned it around and it opened. And then a bright idea hit upon him that we should urinate into the, the tank. Right? Now we were too short, so therefore from the second standard we brought some uh, a chair and uh, uh, stood up on the chair while one fellow was watching to see whether there was some, uh, somebody coming, uh, we took turns to pass urine. So we did so and then we put the lid back again and we were waiting and, the, and he came. Ask you he said. Oh, yes. yes sir. Right. So we, we climbed down to the car and he started the car. Nothing happened, just started. So he went downhill, he said, okay, downhill. Then our hearts were in our mouths as the climb up from Mirakampalya came. So he took the car and this, she, she just went up beautifully and then landed in Askiria. We got down, he said, what happened? What we expected did not happen. So uh, we theorized that Probably we didn't have enough urine, so next day we we we, we drank more water and uh, pumped in more of urine, right? And that day also, car went down, passed the municipality, near a Kampalia, went up, thought, stopped. No, it didn't stop. It just went went straight through into Askari. Now this went on and on and on. Now, when when all this happened. Uh, we thought, right, okay, that uh, we, now we, we put this thing into action. That is, here are, we had a, we had knowledge that only petrol drives cars, but then we had observation that urine also can drive cars. So we had an alternative hypothesis, and we matched it against a null hypothesis, and we put the into test. We put into test with a lot of urine, and then we made the observation too and then we put in knowledge too. We said, the, our, our conclusion was that Harley Davidson cars run well on boys' urine. Now, now remember, we put boys because there were no girls, right? We didn't put children's urine, we put boys' urine. So we were very careful, we were good scientists those days, right? And uh, so that was our hypothesis. Now, that is only we, so we were all excited about our, our discovery, but there was one wet blanket. With a, he had a very high, high, he had a high IQ. He smothered our excitement. So he, he gave us some questions. I said, Harley Davidson started with motorcycles, right? So he said, yes. Uh, this Harley Davidson car, like mobiles, mob motor motorcycles, has central steering and battery. Yes, yes, that's right. So the Harley Davidson car is based on the Mobike prototype. She said, maybe, yes. So Mobikes don't have spare wheels, yes. Mobikes don't have water coolers, yes. So what's your point? We, we dumb idiots ask the same at the same time from this, 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 this chap. So he said, so since spare wheels and water coolers was not in Mobike prototype, uh, prototype, they placed them on the sides. She said, maybe. So the opening on the side we pissed into must be for the coolant and not for the petrol. Since petrol tanks in Mobikes are central. So he thought, oh my God, he's a brilliant fellow. <laughs> How did he cover this, right? So then we, we went round, right around the car searching for the, the real petrol opening. And we never saw that. There was only one opening. It was only l lots of time later that we came to learn that the, the opening for the petrol tank is, uh, is placed in the boot of the car, the rear boot of the car. And uh, it was something like this. If you open the bonnet, if you open the rear boot, sorry, rear boot, you will find where the, the 
the spare tire should be is the petrol tank and on top of that is the uh, is the opening so uh, therefore we came to the conclusion right okay we did urinate into the uh, the coolant into the radiator rather than into the into the petrol tank so we concluded that that way and the person who came up with this alternative hypothesis was a person by the name of slim we call him slim um, and he, so he said harley davidson placed the petrol tank along the central line as in more bikes but hid the lid behind the boot to prevent school boys pissing into it so so that was a so, so said, okay that's another example of how you put two and two together and make six right now so we had four people and slim was the one who had the higher iq uh, by that time john f kennedy had died and jacqueline kennedy was uh, single and he wanted to marry jacqueline kennedy he wrote poems to this uh, lady and she was very impressed by the poem poetry uh, she gave a scholarship to him to princeton from princeton he went to washington university did law and then ended up in the world bank as the richest of the four of us uh, who who pissed into the tank uh, the, the the rest of the three that is uh, two entered the medical faculty and one entered the uh, the dental faculty the dental faculty man has a prolific practice in colombo 5 and he is the next richest man the 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 two of us who entered the medical faculty we ended up being very poor and uh, we regret it even now doing medicine right so this is what was slim so if you in terms of knowledge where was slim was he gullible no was he a doubting thomas no he didn't doubt everything but he doubted that the observation that we made was he smart yes maybe he he practiced with reason and caution was he brilliant yes he not only detected the insufficiencies and inaccuracies but also proposed alternatives like all good researchers i think it is time for you to assess your own self in terms of the knowledge that you have in your head and i think is also time for me to stop but not before reminding you that we know so little and the little we know is mostly polluted and impure thank you